Hey guys, welcome to Overcrest. I'm Chris and Jake is not here, but I've put something together for you guys that I've been thinking of doing for a very long time. Now, you may know by the title of the episode that this is a little bit about my Pinto trip that I did a few years ago with my daughter. But one thing I've never done is really share the story one on one with you guys. And the way that I'd like to do that is grab the article that I wrote for I wrote for Road and Track back then, which is stuck behind a paywall right now. If you go to Road and Track's website, you can see it, but you can't read it. Don't tell anybody that I'm sharing it with you guys uh, and we'll be good to go. Anyway, I'm going to read the story to you as written and maybe I'll share some photos or maybe I'll make the Overcrest logo do like the DVD bounce for those that are watching on YouTube or anything like that. But if I think of anything while I'm telling the story, any anecdotes or anything like that, I will interrupt myself and we'll come back and uh, keep going on the story after the story within the story of whatever it is that I come up with. All right, guys, here we go. How a Pinto became the best car I have ever owned. That was my first car. I swear to God, I learned how to drive in one just like this. A man motioned emphatically towards the car. He walked around it, hands on his hips. The wagon with the wood. Man, wow. He paused that way for a second before crossing his arms. The tone of his voice changed, becoming slower and quieter as he recalled what happened to the car. I wrapped that goddamn around a tree. Buzzing fluorescent lights of a forgettable gas station in Wyoming lit the man. We were three days into a trip across the West in a 1973 Pinto. On his head was a bandana. It had a mullet, or maybe not a mullet, and just a bunch of hair tucked under it. He wore a button-up shirt and jeans held up with a large round belt buckle. But he wasn't a cowboy. His white sneakers betrayed him. Oh shit, really? Yeah, backward into the tree too. The tow truck driver said it should have exploded. Got lucky, I guess. I put the pump back on its cradle and turned to the probably mullet man. Yeah, I guess so. Glad you're not dead. He cackled in agreement, took a picture of the car to show his dad, and clambered back into a used up dusty red truck. It was no use explaining to the multitude of my temporary gas station friends that Pintos didn't all explode and that they were in the median of deaths for that kind of thing, even doing better than some. It wasn't worth the conversation and you'd sound like an argumentative asshole having it. You'd say, whoa, buddy, no way. They didn't all blow up. It's a great car. The 510 fared much worse, as did some of the Hondas or the VW Bug. The words could come out and their eyes would glaze over as you slapped the roof like an exuberant car salesman. Who gives a shit? Nobody. I'll interject there. Essentially what the story is here is that everybody kind of gets a preconceived notion of, of what a car is, right? So if you have a if you have a Pinto and none of the, this is a Squire wagon. So this is the wagon version of the Pinto. Zero of these things blew up. None. The reason that these things blew up is there was a, um, obviously there's a lot of extra metal on the back of a Pinto, which is part of what probably saved everybody's butts. But there was a, there's a little nut or something on top of the, the pumpkin on the, these are rear wheel drive, um, on the little differential bell housing and the gas tank would just get shoved right into that thing. And boom, that was it. It was, it was over. There was, there was no saving after that. You were going to burn alive. And if you look at some of the videos of crash testing and stuff, it's pretty, it's pretty violent. But it wasn't this one. This wasn't the car that did that. And guess what? Lots of people burned alive in other cars. But uh, this is the one that I think it was probably because Ford had kind of a, they had like kind of like an underwriting fiasco about this. So there was like a journalist and a newspaper and stuff. And they went through and they, they discovered that Ford knew all along which kind of made it a, all a, a big thing. So it was really kind of about nothing except for the fact that Ford hid it. If they hadn't have hidden it, and if they just would have said, hey, yeah, sorry, let's fix this, I think we probably would be in a, in a better place with the Pinto. Anyway, you'd say, whoa, buddy, no way. They didn't all blow up. It's a great car. You know, the Datsun 510 fared much worse, as did Honda's or the VW Bug. The words would come out and their eyes would glaze over, glaze over as you slap the roof like an exuberant car salesman. Who gives a shit? Nobody. And besides, Mullet Man didn't even exist. He's just an amalgamation of about 10 people who all told me they crashed their Pinto in the 70s. Some had mullets, some didn't. 
Some were women, some were men, but they all told the same story. Pinto Squire wagons were terrible places to make good memories. A day earlier, my daughter was looking at her Nintendo, buried in Mario Kart, ignoring me. Earlier that afternoon, I'd scolded her. The cliches of kids on road trips had taken hold. The incessant, are we there yet, is a real thing. This prospect of the future reward or wherever we were going was a fog that hung over the day. At the time, that fog of the future was obscuring the first geological evidence of the Rocky Mountains. Just between the 53rd and 54th wall drug sign you see, after climbing a low-grade hill for a few miles, there's a turnout. It's near a not really an actual place called Cactus Flat. There are, as described, no services, and it's just a simple hop-on, hop-off. The vista is vast. There is a tree in the distance, and that is about it. It sits by itself, saving its seat between the car and the horizon. Dad, why are we stopping? Look. At what? Just look. She looked. Wow. It was a legitimate wow, the kind that takes up space and time is followed by a weighty silence. For anyone that lives in a world filled with either trees or buildings, the vast negative space of the open plains of the Dakotas can be a lot to take in. It's difficult as we age to have new experiences, and time accelerates as a result. We see the same things over and over again, and our brain drags the input into the trash can, giving it no further thought. The time, as a result, skids by as the familiar warps away, forgotten. The nuances that we may see just aren't worth it as our brain takes the path of least resistance. I watched her eyes as she saw the hugeness of the world for the first time. It might as well have been a horizon to infinity. We both experienced something for the first time there. Her, the breadth of the earth, and probably some perspective of size and being. Myself, the potential and therefore lost potential of human wonderment. AC Solutions offers complete plug-and-play air conditioning conversion kits for your classic BMW, such as the E30, E28, and E24, and soon-to-be Porsche. Featuring OEM quality components with period-correct finishes and materials, their products are designed as a drop-in upgrade to your old factory system, but with the performance of modern technology. Their products stem from hands-on design and development with a deep knowledge and passion for these vehicles. They're designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts and come complete with a full warranty and quality instructions mirroring those of a factory manual. Check them all out at acsolutions.co. That's acsolutions.co. CSF Cooling has always been at the forefront of quality products for a fair price. With a rich history stretching over seven decades, they provide the best high-performance and OEM Plus cooling systems on the market today. CSF offers over 3,000 different cooling applications for the most popular makes and models on the road today. From classic copper brass radiators for Land Cruisers, Jeeps, and Datsuns, to vintage 80s Mercedes, BMW, and Audi and Porsche platforms, all the way up two new vehicles check out their expanding classic series lineup and be sure to check them out at csfrace.com or on social media petrol box is a monthly service made specifically for the automotive enthusiast each month they carefully select items including tools detailing supplies apparel garage gear stickers and publications to be sent right there to your doorstep it's a curated selection of the latest and greatest gear in the industry, and there's actually two different levels of subscription to choose from. The Petrobox Basic costs less than 20 bucks a month, while the Petrobox Premium gets you even more gear for $39.95 a month. Check them out at mypetrolbox.com, and be sure to use the code OVERCROSS at checkout to get $6 off your first month. Age 7 going on 8 is a unique time. You could argue it's all unique, but so far there have been a few really particularly special moments. She was starting to be able to reason pretty well and conversations were suddenly maturing. I could talk to her like an adult and most of the time she'd get it and her logic, it's pure. Pretty big, huh? Yeah. Why do you think there's so much nothing? I don't know, maybe nobody's family is here to visit. Nobody could argue with that. I want you to start thinking about where we are now not worry so much about where we're going, okay? Okay. 
She didn't touch her Nintendo again the entire trip. George Washington looked on stoically from almost 6,000 feet above sea level as I downshifted the cruise-o-matic transmission into second gear. The engine was shrieking in protest. The gauge to the left of the speedometer that would normally tell you the frequency at which the engine was screaming held only a fuel gauge. An entire segment of the cluster, five or six inches around, was dedicated purely to fuel quantity. There was nothing including information as critical as the revolution as to which finely crafted hunks of metal are hurtling around two feet from your legs. Both hands were white on the perforated 70s steering wheel wrap and my foot was to the carpet. I wondered if I removed the floor mat if I might get another two horsepower. Maybe the cushion in my old, maybe I'll buy some new balances for hiking. Sneakers had too much give in the soul. It led me to one of those times where you know what you're doing is fruitless, but you do it anyway. And you check. It wasn't the carpet. Things got worse as we began to climb higher into the mountains. With the lack of power, crawling up to the red line from second to third was just how you'd imagine it to be. Careening toward the earth in a commercial airplane, jet engines screaming, people yelling unintelligibly, stuff rattling down the aisle. People with heads between their legs, emergency oxygen masks for yourself and not your child first falling from the ceiling, only to be saved moments before impact as the engine shifted to third at 72 miles per hour. You take a huge breath as things settle down and then it would all repeat. Not having a tachometer was a blessing. Not having a tachometer was a curse. All I had was my rear view mirror. There, I could gaze into my angry, gritting face as I jockey-whipped the Pinto within an absolute inch of its life, over and over and over again. Overlooking a valley below Little Mountain in Wyoming, which is around 9,000 feet, my phone buzzed. It was an editor of mine. I pulled over to the side of the road and took the call, parking at a turnout just below the summit. Afterward, the car turned over slowly, resisting me like an abused animal. It wouldn't start. With an ambient temperature well over 90, everything was hot. There was, of course, no temperature gauge to let anyone know how hot, but it was definitely hot. There was a check engine light, which may or may not light up if things got too hot, with a go-no-go type of warning system. Also, maybe not. The air filter ended up in the trunk, superseded for as much air as possible. In old hot rod movies, guys flipped it over for extra horsepower. Eventually it started up again and then started moving. Slowly. With the car chugging along in first gear, it showed the speedometer bouncing at five miles per hour, and then 10. It was painfully slow, accelerating at a jogger's pace. With no air movement and the time I spent leaning over the boiling motor, sweat had begun to pour down my furrowed face as I stared through the windscreen. Fuck this and fuck this car! I yelled at the car while my wide-eyed daughter looked on as she leaned towards the passenger door. The steering wheel with the wrap bowed as I jerked it back and forth, frustrated. At about 15 miles per hour, whatever compression the thing had started to do its thing. The speed picked up. It shifted a second around 30 or so, and the situation repeated. Eventually, I was able to get it to a top speed of around 35. I gritted my teeth together even more, knowing Utah was a long, long ways away, and there was nothing left but elevation. I cursed myself for not bringing my highly modified 72 Porsche 911, a vehicle that, even though it came from the same area, felt like a hypercar in comparison. Dad? I didn't answer. I was too frustrated. Dad, why are you angry at the car? I didn't know how to answer the question. Why was I so angry at the car? At some point, the realization that you're asking a car to do something it cannot and will not be able to do has to be acknowledged. It took all of South Dakota and a huge chunk of Wyoming to realize it. The biggest curse of road trips has been the GPS with a time estimate. It's naturally frustrating to lose time. The battle with the clock becomes a war. I realized I was doing in a varying shade 
what I told my daughter not to do. I was focusing on time and was struggling not to lose it. I'd given up hours trying to make more time in a machine that couldn't. The reality is, it's the most finite resource in the world, and you have to do the best with what you have right now. For the Pinto and its passengers, that meant agnostically ascending mountains at 35 miles per hour. With an AM-only radio, no tape deck, and no 8-track, choices were limited. When it comes to music, a 7-year-old is too young to own a genre yet, so I swizzled around the AM dial. Different stations flipped and flapped in and out of tune. Minute micro-adjustments of the knob would pull in someone talking about Jesus or local stuff for sale. One guy had a brand new in the box, I repeat, a brand new in the box miter saw. A few more flips in another direction would bring in some fuzzy country music. Usually nothing mainstream, but sometimes you'd be peppered with some Neil Diamond. She liked it all and thumbs up every single time I asked her if whatever we were listening to was okay. The miles pounded by, sometimes fast, mostly slow. Up mountains, down valleys, through small towns, and out of them again. The Pinto turned into a small, Main Street-centric town in northern Utah. Almost every no-stoplight town in the West is forgettable, but as a whole, they have gravity. But like most nothing, if you have enough of it, it adds up to something. In this case, the summation is a psyche so collective that it defines the West. Self-sufficiency backed by pride. There's an unjustified feeling you get passing every unincorporated city limit that you'll be shunned at the gas station, local one-room restaurant, or shooed out with a straw broom if you ask to use the bathroom. But it never happens. Instead, every door jingle is greeted cheerfully, and every meal is made with the feeling that the money you're paying for it really does keep the lights on. The only one that makes you feel like an outsider is yourself. Somewhere along the way, the car had began to smoke. Thin wisps at first. A small haze mistook for a smudge on the rear view or glare on the hatch glass. Hours later, at a gas fill-up stop, I reached out and dragged my finger across the dirty rear glass. It smeared. I grabbed a paper rag from the window washer box and rubbed it across the glass, hoping for a color. It was black with dirt. This wasn't the first problem the car had thrown at us. A spark plug wire had melted outside the Batlands, turning the car into a three-cylinder tractor. In the fading light, I could see the electricity exiting the wire like a ghost, making its way into the cylinder exhaust manifold that had melted it. Later, I had walked up to the parts counter at a small town parts store, where the girl immediately focused on my daughter, who shyly stepped behind me. I asked if the attached shop could check the transmission fluid and offer advice on the issue. The young man who did got tipped 20 bucks just for burning his finger on the transmission dipstick tube as he added just over a quart of transmission fluid. I would add a quart when it quit smoking, or about every 150 miles from then on out. Something was very wrong. We were still hundreds of miles from Vegas, our new final destination, where I would leave the car until I could figure out what was wrong with it. With a case of ATF in the trunk, things would just have to sort themselves out for now. With a finger micro-tuning its radio dial, the Pinto passed by historical markers, each one a testament to some very important thing that had happened in that very spot. It's impossible to stop for them all, so you end up stopping for none. A big sign indicated the marker-filled road was a scenic byway. A song fuzzed in. A horse with no name by America. It crooned melancholy about being in the desert and how when you're lost out there, it doesn't even matter what your name is. According to the sign, we were on Flaming Gorge Scenic Byway. There was a huge river somewhere off to our right. Unfortunately, we couldn't see it. The byway, like many across the country, just isn't good enough. They're a compromise, a way through, a shortcut for those who could just ever so slightly be bothered to wander off the beaten path. I slammed on the brakes and ripped the wheel to the right and started churning over a gravel road that looked like on-location filming area for Andy Ware's The Martian. Dust plumed out from behind the car. The road has two lanes, but really it's just one. It was smooth, but sharp tire-hating rocks lined the edge, waiting for mistakes. 
I had about three gallons of water in the car, and those sharp rocks knew it. The path twisted inward on itself in no discernible pattern. The switchbacks were steep enough that downshifts to first gear and maintaining momentum were mandatory. There would be no stopping and restarting on these roads. Coming to a stop would mean reversing backward to try again, gaining momentum to head up the other side. There was no cell signal in the wasteland as we left our dirt fog trail across the desert. Zooming in just made the map blocky, angular, and useless. I grabbed a compass out of my glove compartment and zagged my way across the desert west towards the river that the byway was named for, Green River. After 25 miles of varying maintenance gravel roads, a signpost leaned over next to the few trees I'd seen in over an hour. The road there was separated into two deeper ruts by scraggly grass. I turned in and continued to the west, following my compass. I was flanked by prickly green bushes and rooted tumbleweeds. The pinto slid between an arch of trees that opened the gates to a rocky beach and crystal clear water of the Green River. It was more of a reservoir, and the finger of water that jutted into the desert near the road had receded at least 50 yards from its historically average spot. The Pinto's low, rich idol disappeared into the distance as I turned off the ignition. The vacuum of sound without it washed in like a tidal wave off the water. There was no breeze, and the blood in your ears got in the way of absolute silence. It was pure solitude hours to enjoy, and we owned it for that moment. We swam in the chilly water, and the daughter learned how to skip stones. The cost was only time and risk. Preparation was important, not just for peace of mind. Had something gone wrong and the car broke down, it would have been arduous, dangerous even. But with a compass and water, it just would have ended up a different, longer story. Utah disappeared behind us as we headed towards Vegas. The car was hurting, and our round trip was turning into a destination journey. The wisps of smoke were now an embarrassing James Bond special, and the gravel road excursion had probably blown the brand new rear struts. The sun was finally arching down, stretching shadows of the car over the center line into the oncoming lane. This is where I, there's, there's memories I have here that are really special like take them to my grave take them to my grave special some of the moments that I can replay in my mind (sighs) the sun was finally arching down stretching shadows of the car over the center line into the oncoming lane the blue sky was diffusing to orange from wildfires and glowed brilliantly above a towering monocline even though afternoon was waning it was hot and both windows were down to the frame Her arm was out the window doing the flying thing, but manufacturing the flight as 40 miles per hour just wasn't enough to gain any lift. Locks of her long red hair wafted in and out of the window, catching the light. It looked like licks of fire. I couldn't take my eyes off the scene. She asked if I was crying. I wasn't really, but she knew that someone trying not to cry looked like She'd done it herself many times after being scolded for a messy room or a sibling squabble. I wasn't sure what to say. I wasn't one to laud praise and affirmation on my kids for no reason. Everything had to be earned. Too often, undue adulation breeds a lack of contrast in understanding the value of personal growth, perseverance, or dealing properly with success and failure. But I was crying. I blinked and the water in my eyes blurred my view. The sun in her hair exploded in a fog of scattered light as my eyelids pulled tears across my vision. I was the past the point of hiding it. This is the best moment of my entire life. You are beautiful, I told her. Telling her why wasn't important. She'd figure that out someday. She smiled without any weight of the world. She said she loved me and looked back out the window, trying to fly.